We have been on this issue for a while, uh, and not to go very long to the past, but over the last two years, we have been engaging in the expert group, the Commission expert group, helping the Commission in preparing this proposal, so we have somewhere a kind of joint responsibility here. I must say that the climate, the quality of exchange, the maturity of debates was, I think, a very valuable experience for all of us, and I think that, that 10 years of stakeholder dialogue has been helping in that process. I also would like to um, welcome warmly Jesper uh, Linhardt from Novo Nordisk. Susan Stormer from Novo was also in that expert group, and she was also representing CISA Europe in the hearings at the Parliament. I must say that the tone, the personal commitment, but also the company commitment of Novo in this topic has been extremely valuable. So thank you for being with us. And Michel, uh, last but not least, will also be expressing the voice of his company from Solvay. Michel has been quite critical in meetings we had with Commissioner Tajani and through his CEO or former CEO, the meetings we had with Commissioner Barnier. Michel Doucin, Victor Kier, also very well welcome. Uh, it's also since many years that we are in the same marathon in trying to see to which extent Europe can regain some leadership on an issue which we, be, we all believe are important uh, for companies. I would like to, s to, to say sorry to many organizations that cannot sit on this panel that, have, that should have the same license to be here to make their voice known. ACA for the Associations of Accounts, they will have a session on the 4th of June um, and so maybe you will be able to attend their meeting. Also Eurosif, it was said by Jim, shareholders are not expressing maybe enough their voice but at least through Eurosif who managed to go for a co-signed letter together with Berg, the consumer organization. Yes, Berg has entered the debate. Uh, it could have been interesting, but they will do it from the floor. So, um, Eurosif, please be as active by sitting here with us today. The way we are going to run this session is very easy. There will be five uh, special sessions. One, I will start with each panelist for 90 seconds. One minute and 30 seconds. Uh, asking how they see this proposal as a risk, an opportunity, and if they are diplomats, some will say as a challenge. Uh, but it's not for them now in that one minute and 30 seconds to come with the arguments. That's for later. This will be a first massage to the audience to ask you afterwards what are some of your reactions today and if there are some shareholder representatives, don't hesitate uh, to take them the floor. Then, based on your expectations or views or questions, I would like to use that for nurturing the panel debate. There will be another chance for the floor then to react to the panel debate, and then if we still have some time, uh, I will ask for another one minute each for some closing remarks about next steps their organizations are going to take. I will make it very simple. I would like to ask eventually, um, let's not make any order here, but Jérôme, you are uh, next to me. I will invite you to take your first 90 seconds and I will use my chrono for that. Okay. Make big signs when I'm at 91 seconds. Um, hello, everyone. Um, for ECCJ members across Europe, um, we've been advocating for increased transparency for years. Of course, this uh, legislative, legislative proposal is a welcome step and represents a great opportunity. But our strong concern shared by many NGOs in Europe is that it might as well be a missed opportunity. There's a new modern understanding of CSR promoted by the European Commission uh, supported by the European Parliament that says that CSR is about responsibility for impacts on society. The universally endorsed UN guiding principles on business and human rights recall that it is central to respect for human rights that companies know the risk they pose, the impacts they have, and disclose them. 
the identification of risks and impacts is central to corporate responsibility and their disclosure is the cornerstone of any robust non-financial reporting. Our concern is that the way they are addressed in the proposal lead to a pretty much empty box and a lot of window dressing would prevail. What are the four main challenges there? First is the narrow way the risk could be defined. Companies face some risk that may affect their performance and companies pose some risk on society and the planet. Non-financial reporting should be about both. Disclosure of the most significant risks and impacts for affect to, that matter to affected people should, be not, should not be left to companies' discretion. Second challenge, many risks are located in the company's supply chains, as the recent tragedies in Bangladesh show. Already, so supply chain. <laughs> Well, it's a missed opportunity, maybe, and then you have the four challenges that you will explain okay, later on. Sorry for that. Patrick. C'est bon? Oui. OK. Je vais alterner, je vais parler en français, comme ça les interprètes. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Patrick Hitchett, secrétaire général adjoint de la CES. Pour nous, je crois que c'est clairement un, un défi, mais c'est aussi et surtout une gigantesque opportunité. C'est quelque chose que nous demandons depuis plus de dix ans, dans les, dès qu'il y a eu le livre vert de la Commission, on l'a demandé dans la, dans la résolution de 2004. Euh, c'est une étape, c'est une première étape, mais qui est nécessaire. On, on l'a entendu ce matin, « It's good for business ». C'est vrai aussi qu'on ne va pas attendre, il y a neuf pays qui ont adopté des mesures, on ne va pas attendre que le 27e ou le 28e ait adopté quelque chose pour penser à remettre un peu de cadre, un peu d'ordre et un peu de transparence là-dedans. Et puis je dirais que je sors du textile, je viens, c'est mon background du textile, j'étais en 2005 au Bangladesh lorsque Spectrum s'est effondré, 66 morts. J'ai depuis quitté en mai 2011, mais quand vous voyez ce qui se passe au Bangladesh cette fois-ci, c'est 1100 personnes qui sont, qui sont, euh, qui sont tuées. Dans le... on, on est responsable. On est responsable. Et je vois le chemin qui a été parcouru entre Spectrum 2005 et aujourd'hui l'émotion qui, qui, qui consent. Je crois que c'est effectivement une opportunité qu'on ne peut pas laisser passer. Alors c'est vrai, je suis d'accord avec, avec Jérôme. Il y a de la marge de progression, mais j'y reviendrai. Je continue en français. Euh, bien entendu. Yeah, I have another 90 seconds then in English. <laughs> okay, I have problems with my government, but I'm going to speak in English. Uh, <laughs> Firstly, I would say that uh, for us, this uh, uh, project of directive is uh, welcome, and in our view, it's the minimum we can expect for, from Europe at this moment. Let me be clear. Last year, our national business organization made have organized a, a, a meeting on the question of reporting. And what we heard was that the, the main concern of companies like, for instance, Sanofi and, and others, was not regulations coming, coming from the states regarding reporting, but the requirements from all the rating agencies which uh, overburden the activity of the companies requiring more and more detailed information and trying to be different from each other. So for instance, Sanofi has to pay uh, full time three person to all year, uh, all, all year long to fill um, forms which are longer and longer. And they received last year 42 of search forms. So in our view, what the Commission is starting is something which could be also simplification, accusation, uh, helping the companies to identify what is 
more relevant and what is less relevant. And there is also something to do regarding this absolutely f f stupid market of the rating agencies which are competing with the most details they will, they, they will provide uh, to their uh, uh, in investors. And to this regard, there is also the problem of risk of balkanization of Europe with now nine governments <laughs> which have policies and uh, which demand things different, a light demand, but there is a risk of uh, development in this field. Um, I would just add that Europe is not isolated. It was said by Richard Owit. There is now many uh, countries in the world which, cons which consider reporting as important. And so Europe is in a position to give a signal regarding how to harmonize reporting in the world. And, uh, it's only a starting point. It's very weak as a proposal, but we have to start with something. Hello. Uh, for me, it's a positive signal because I am convinced that uh, a company without an internal reporting uh, extra financial uh, reporting uh, will suffer from less resilience than another. So more reporting than report for me. That is important because it obliges you to define indicator. It obliges you to consider which are material and not. And at the same time, if you see a certain, could I say, bad evolution, to try to understand why and so uh, to understand the connectivity. So positive signal. Do we need extra uh, a report? I think that for companies, listed company, of course, we have to give confidence to our institutional uh, shareholders, not day traders, of course. It's not the target. If we need that, we need to go in a direction of publication of more clear comparable indicator. When I say more, it means maybe for the chemical sector, 10, 12 indicator, not more than that. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's for us in the future, it's certainly a key point. ESG disclosure is a positive signal, as I told you, but we need clarification because certain parts are not really 100% clear in my mind. For instance, the auditor, in the future only one auditor, for example, Maybe, oh, for a company like Solvay, we published already everything somewhere. Do we need to publish an additional small document or a few sentences? And uh, finally, it's an opportunity for everybody to have an open platform to exchange best practices and to work together uh, to a, a clearer future. Thanks. Thank you very much. As a business with a long-term perspective, we understand that we are operating in a society. It's a society that on the one hand grants us our license to operate. It does that by uh, trusting us. On the other hand, it's a society that we impact. And we impact it both positively in terms of the products we're supplying, whereby we create some shared value, but we also impact it negatively. Creating uh, transparent disclosure on non-financial reporting is a proposal that we have uh, that we support and we support it strongly. Uh, we've been doing it ourselves for almost two decades now and we've seen the value of doing this and we'd like to extend those to more European businesses. Those values are first of all trust through transparency. Second of all, it is a competitive advantage both in terms of uh, attracting talent, in terms of differentiating you from your suppliers, but most importantly of creating trustworthy long-term relationships to your key stakeholders across your different spheres. Uh, lastly, by making this a standard across companies, we believe that CSR issues that are fundamental to companies will be elevated to the places they belong. That means the board levels, the executive management levels, and discussions will start to integrate how businesses fundamentally drive and create value across social, environmental, and financial aspects. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, Maxime. Good morning to all of you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, the first thing I want to say is that many companies uh, are progressively integrating CSR into their company strategies. 
And they do so not because they are forced to do so. They do so because they believe in the benefits of doing so. Um, so there is a growing awareness amongst companies that CSR can have a positive impact on their short and long-term business performance. It can help to manage risks and be a business opportunity by giving a competitive edge on the market. In line with this, we have seen positive trends in terms of CSR reporting, and recently in 2011, the latest data available shows that 95% of the 250 largest enterprises worldwide report already on their social and ecological behavior. And we are convinced that this trend will continue. For that reason, we are disappointed uh, by the European Commission's decision to propose a legislative initiative on disclosure of non-financial informa information. I'll give more details on the reasons why we are disappointed uh, in a later round. We believe that the proposed regulatory approach um, is running the risk of demotivating companies that have embarked on genuine CSR activities on their own. And instead of applying a ticking the box approach, uh, we think that the business driven purpose of CSR, which is to contribute to business goals, um, to address by addressing social and env environmental challenges over and beyond what is required by law should prevail and must be safeguarded. Thank you. Thank you very briefly. Uh, in 2008, we introduced a requirement for reporting on the, along similar lines as a commission proposal. 94% of Danish companies have chosen to report rather than state they have no CSR policy. They didn't feel forced to do so, but they thought it was the right thing and their experience have confirmed it. What they all say are saying, we can see that from impact studies, is that to work with CSR without reporting is like sowing seeds without harvesting the corn, you only get the real benefits by reporting. So the experience is quite certainly positive. We support the Commission proposal <coughs> because it will, if we adopt it quickly, it will be an act of faith. Faith in the strengths of European business, faith in the values that are laid down in the Treaty of the European Union, faith that Europe can once again be a global leadership role and, and show the rest of the world that we believe in the values that our societies are built on and that they will increase the competitiveness, not decrease the competitiveness of European business. Thank you.